Sadistic Penguin Studios presents the At The Show Podcast with Tom Yumper garcia Okay, you people sit tight, hold the fort, and keep the home fires burning. And if we're not back by dawn, call the president. And Tony Chalsa Burke. I don't know this industry jargon, YP, MP, whatever, okay? All I know is that I cannot get a record contract. We cannot get a record contract unless I take these tapes. It's almost time. So grab a drink, get your popcorn ready, and join the film discussion with two guys from Chicago talking movies. Hello and welcome to another episode of the At The Show podcast presented to you by the Sadistic Penguin Studios. I'm one of your co-hosts, Tom Yumpa garcia and I'm with my other co-host, Tony, a.k.a. Chelsea, a.k.a. The Sugar Baggy, Bert. How you doing, man? Doing really good. Very excited to be here tonight. I am glad that we are sharing this time together on this awesome Friday. So am I, my friend. So am I always looking forward to talk movies, uh, get our minds off things, and kind of, uh, you know, I move on to, uh, you know, better times during the week, because... Uh, yes. Work sucks. <laughs> it sure does. As as one band said, work sucks. I know, you know, <laughs> but nobody left me roses by the stairs. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so Tom, it's Oscar week, my friend. It's Oscar week. It's uh, you know, me and you, of course, we're big movie fans. We have a movie podcast, but Oscars is always like one of my favorite times of the year because I have all those films I see and I want to see who wins. Sometimes it's heartbreak season for some people. And sometimes it's like, man, I really hope this person wins and they win. You're like, man, they really accomplished something. I would definitely agree. Um, And when we started this endeavor, this was definitely a time period I was also excited for um, growing up in a a house that watched this just like it was the Super Bowl, um, watched them equally. Um, It's exciting. This Sunday, I think it's going to be a good one. Yeah, man. It's a lot of great films, man. A lot of heavyweight films coming out there. Yeah. But uh, let's go into our usual segment, my man. Let's get into what we've been watching this week. Let's do it. That's a me. And also, what were you just watching? All right, man. So what you been watching this week? Oh, first off, I'm going to start and talk about Thanksgiving, a horror film that came out, well, just this past uh, October, November-ish for the Thanksgiving season. It is uh, was a part of the Grindhouse movie series as a little trailer in the middle. Now it's a movie with Eli Roth uh, directed, watched it for the very first time last night with uh, some people and... You know, I don't know about this movie, you know, I think it was missing some things. I think it could have been a little bit better. I also think it was some fun. Um, big Patrick Dempsey in the 80s fan. So if he wasn't in this movie, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it as much. But still worth checking out for some good laughs, some cheesy deaths. But definitely not a serious uh, horror film, I don't, I don't really think. Have you ever seen this one yet? No, I haven't seen it, but I know my guy, um, what's his name? I can't think of his name. He plays Lewis Litt in Suits. I can't think of a time. Oh, he, he, he is in this movie. If I could say, watch this movie, it's funny you bring him up. Um, mm-hmm. Great, great job. He's, he's, he's awesome. Yeah, he, he plays like a real, I'm a real king for seeing characters that are ridiculous. And he plays a really good one in this one, in this movie. Yeah. Rick Hoffman is his name. He, uh, he's. If you guys haven't seen Suits, it starts off slow. It's a slow burn, but like as his character develops in the series, like he's the best character in the whole show. Oh, uh, I know, I know. Harvey uh, gets a lot of uh, love. You know, Harvey um, gets a lot of love in the show, and so does Mike. But like uh, Lewis Lit, just his his mannerisms, his whole character development is just great. Um, but uh, yeah, if you get a chance, I'd say you know it's you know it's if you like these kind of movies definitely worth the time but you know it's it's definitely not at the top of like a, a first halloween or even out halloween three for those who don't even like that um number two uh was blackberry um i don't know if you've seen this movie but this movie was uh really 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 ridiculous and uh well uh if you get a chance check it out it was in a good way ridiculous in that 
It describes the creation of the BlackBerry phone. But what's mm. awesome about it is some of the people who star in it, like uh, Jay Baroshell, who was in lots and lots of different things, like This Is The End, um, She's Out Of My League. But in here, he's got a serious turn and also is Glenn Howerton, if you are not familiar with him. He is from It's Always Sunny. Here's a quick clip. All right. Woodman wants to see it. We're going to Bell Atlantic tomorrow. What? What? New York City tomorrow. Um, if you're looking for a movie that you're just looking to see uh, a really awesome creation, um, really good good movie, and seeing a couple actors who uh, are out of a little bit doing something different, I'd say check it out. You ever hear this one yet? No, I have. I've heard of the movie, but I haven't seen it. But uh, BlackBerry used to be like my go-to phone before yeah. it. Um, it got you know kind of ran out of use, and they stopped making them. Yeah. Uh, and then I just the only thing I hated about it was his damn uh, the knob in the middle that always got dirty. You had to go get replaced. It's on Hulu now. Um, it just came out like a week and a half ago. I've seen some people put it on. Uh, it should have been nominated for some uh, Academy Awards because the performances by especially the two star actors are definitely worth watching alone. And if you were a user of it, me personally, I didn't really know too much about it until watching this movie. You know, they used to own like seventy five percent of the cell phone market. Now they own 0%. So it's interesting to see the rise and the fall of this. And there's some other good supporting actors and good, definitely worth checking out. Yeah, it was a popular phone, man. It's a big business phone. Yeah. So, um, But the two movies I watched, uh, the first one is uh, due to TikTok. TikTok always has these clips and then I see them and then it makes me want to watch the movie. Was Limitless with um, Bradley Cooper and... Uh, Robert De Niro about a guy who basically takes a super drug that makes him use more percentage of his brain uh, for his cognitive side, which is kind of funny because people think we only use 10% of our brain, but in reality, we actually use 100% because our body regulates our organs and whatnot. Um, but yeah, this is not a medical show, but basically, uh, it's a pretty, it's a very, very good movie. Um, very underrated to the fact, you know, that it felt kind of cult following that basically made it into a TV series. Uh, have you seen the series or the movie, Tom? Um, it's amazing that you first picked this movie because as soon as you picked it, a big smile crossed my face because <clears throat> I remember me and Katie seeing this in the movie theater and me walking out and immediately what you just said, underrated, really, really awesome. Um, Bradley Cooper does a good job. Um, uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Never saw the television show, but, uh, the movie is definitely worth the watch. Definitely, definitely, yeah. So if you haven't seen it, I would definitely check it out. It's an early Bradley Cooper. Uh, Robert De Niro plays an a hole in it, which is even better. Like that's I think the uh, best oh, yeah. at playing an a hole. Oh, yeah. Um, but the second movie I saw was uh, Funny People, and it's it's kind of I would say a dark comedy. It's not um, it has its funny moments, but it stars uh, Adam Sandler and Leslie Mann and Seth Rog um Seth Rogen. It's actually directed by Judd Apatow. Uh, I love the way the film opens because it opens up with old college videos of Sandler and Apatow. Like they grew up best friends from college and he's just doing a bunch of prank calls. Uh, he basically plays a comedian who has uh, an illness and he's kind of thinks he's going to die. So he hires this guy of uh, a joke maker and another struggling comedian to write jokes for him and help him out and be his personal assistant. And it's just a, it's a, to me, it's like a, one of those movies that, it's not really a time waster. It's an interesting and funny movie because Sam and it just shows Sandler's range as an actor. He can be a comedian. He can be serious. Um, and then you add in Seth Rogen's goofiness in there. And of course, I love Leslie Mann. Um, this is for He's probably one of my favorite movies with her. Uh, it's just, you know, it's got that kind of like feeling to it. Have you seen this one? Uh, yes, I have. Um, but it's been a little while. So um, but when I did see it, I, I did not not have a problem with it. I've always enjoyed Sandler's dramatic work right around this time. I even like Spanglish even, um, mm -hmm. but uh, I like anything with with him around this time period. Um, you know, speaking of Oscars, I think he really should have been nominated for Uncut Gems. That's mm -hmm. one of my favorite movies in the last 10 years. And when he wants to bring it, he can bring it. And when he doesn't want to and just kind of lazy it in, he can do that too. But, you know, it's, it's Sandler. And I think as stated here, you know, um, credible first half of the movie you know in the second half you know it's it's a little sadder you know and you know but still great movie my only problem with it is that it's like isn't it it's like two 240 it's a, it's a longer yeah, it's a longer movie. one but uh 
for a comedy it, this is the first one or a dark comedy that's like that but you know it's worth it i i would definitely agree i don't have a problem with it yeah it's if you haven't seen it check it out uh it's definitely worth it and uh as sam said uh funny people is eminem's greatest role and mm -hmm. just that little you know cameo he does with ray romano mm -hmm. it's probably one of my favorite parts of the film so if you just want to see like a tidbit of it look up eminem ray romano funny people and that like 30 second interaction is is great uh, and especially the uh, one layer that seth rogan gives him at the end um but that's what we've been watching uh let us know what you've been watching over at, at the show pod on twitter or x or whatever the hell it's called uh or hit us up on the uh, facebook at the penguin studios uh, we have a facebook page let us know there or just hit us up on our own handles at lil yumper and the sugar baggy um this so the next segment we're going to get into is something I'm very excited about because I really want to see what this person thought of this film. Um, we're going to bring in Rox, but we're going to give her her little intro and then pull her in. Popular movies of all time, sir. What? What are you thinking? What the hell was that? Miss Roxy, welcome back. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. How are you guys? Good, good. Thank you for coming uh, on. Thank you so much for having me and getting me to watch these movies. It's like I when I was done watching the movie, I was like to drive in with uh, CPG. I was like, if you wanted to watch another movie tonight, like you can watch another movie. And I was like, who am I? Who am I, who am I right now? But that's, that's, that's <laughs> what's cool about this. You know, you, get, in, you get into it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, Rox, your name of your segment is Never Seen It. For those who are first joining our show, the segment involves Roxy watching a film she's never seen before, whether it be a classic or a newer film. Uh, so this week, we actually did a poll, and we had two tie for the role, but we had you let you choose which one it was between Zodiac and Fight Club, and you chose Fight Club. So first things first, like, Rox, have you ever heard of this movie before, you know, we mentioned it to you? Yes, uh, just in the extent of never being able to talk about it. I uh, had absolutely no concept of it beyond that. And I knew that Brad Pitt was in it. That was that was about it. Cool, cool. So you, you, you were recently into a David Fincher like a kick. So we saw Seven first, and then we saw this film. So uh, let's get the big question out of the way. Did the film live up to the hype? Not really. Not for me. <laughs> Uh, it was okay. Um, if you have, obviously, if you have any follow-up questions, I'm happy to answer. But, oh. uh, first initial viewing, um, it was fine. Like, uh, I did talk about it with CPG after the fact, and he kind of answered a lot of the more quirky, nuanced questions that I had. And that in itself made me kind of appreciate the movie a little bit more, just mm -hmm. being able to vocalize you know, just kind of my confusion to it because it's definitely one of those movies where you have to be paying attention. And that sounds dumb because you watch movies to pay attention. But like, I feel like even if, even if I looked away for a second, I was missing something kind of important. And I think with this one, there was a lot going on to where it would benefit me to watch it again, but I already know I'll never do that. So I had to get this, like I had to get everything into this one viewing. If that makes sense. No, it makes sense. Like it's it's one of those films that are kind of like um it's it's a psychological film. Right, Tom? Like what would you say about it, Tom? How would you describe it? My first viewings, um, but I saw this movie, you know, as a junior in high school in nineteen ninety nine, sitting in the movie theater, and my actual initial reactions were more closer to Roxy's than what they currently are today. Um, for those same reasons that uh it was just, it was a lot to take in at first. Um, it's a movie that you need to watch lots and lots and lots and lots. And then I, I ran into a guy at college that was a roommate and that was the only movie he watched. And like, he watched it like every night and I would sit there and be like, okay, I guess I'm getting this more. And that's why movies are different. Some movies you need to just watch them more and more, but it's got some really awesome performances and great parts after you really sit down and I think let it sink in. Oh yeah, I agree with that. Like I, if I had not been able to talk to CPG while I was, after I watched it, yeah. I would have had much more of, I think like a negative review just because mm -hmm. I wasn't understanding it. And like, it's not their job. 
like in my opinion, director's jobs isn't to get you to understand something by the end of the movie. That's what interpretation's all about. But I, I was having a hard time really like kind of understanding what the focal point of the sh- movie was, like what the end goal was. And then obviously after having that conversation with him, it was a lot easier. So I definitely like it a lot more than like my initial reaction after watching it. But unfortunately, I do think it's like a very overhyped movie, just considering. Yeah, it has a lot of allegories and a lot of symbolism in it. But um, like if you what Fincher wanted was it to be open to interpretation, like they don't really answer Mm -hmm. uh, besides the character of Tyler Durden, which, you know, you know, spoiler alert, he's not real. Uh, You kind of know that aspect. But, you know, the character uh, of um, Winnie, Willie, uh, what's her name? Uh. How, uh, Bell, uh, what's her Lena name? Bottom Carter. Yeah, what's her name on the movie? In, in the movie, her name is uh, Marla Singer. Marla Singer, thank Marla. you. I was gonna call her Willie for some reason. She she does, and again, she does no just wonder. a really really good performance in the movie. I'll expose you. Go ahead. I'll expose you. All right, come together. Let yourself. Just that little part right there. Really, mm-hmm. really, she I think is a, an integral part of the movie. Yeah, and I was just waiting for Tim Burton to pop out of nowhere. You know? <laughs> But uh, yeah, but just to, to look at her character, you know, there's all these theories that are going around that she doesn't exist. That you know, uh, this certain character, I want to know what you thought, Roxy, when you saw Meatloaf <laughs> as Bob. Like, what did you think when you saw him come in? Oh, dude, I didn't even know. It took me way too long to realize it was him. I was, I mean, I was looking at his jugs, which is why. <laughs> but like, uh, I, it took me a very long time to realize that it was him, and that's my own fault obviously but uh honestly my favorite one of my favorite like uh this list is very short but i really like holt uh mccallany is that how you say his name he's great i like him a lot from uh uh mine hunter i got a movie for you i'm going to suggest later to you off screen that you really will enjoy but we'll talk about that later perfect yeah i thought he did really well and then um I was actually really kind of like thrown off by Jared Leto's role in the movie. Oh, I thought he was just kind of like thrown in there. Like there wasn't any, they were like, we just need a guy that's like kind of famous. Well, he literally looked like he was 30 seconds to Mars with his white <laughs> hair and everything else. Mm-hmm. You know, that good. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. like the way Edward Norton, like actually narrated the movie. I thought his voice was like, just really a cool way to like ease because I, I like movies that have narration like uh like christmas story and stuff the, like the fact that they're narrating over i like a lot of that stuff and i think edward norton's voice like as silly as that sounds like made it a very approachable movie to kind of like get lost in yeah it's kind of funny you mentioned that because uh when the film was being developed it's actually based off of, um, a novel by the same name named by the chuck palatuck uh, Peter Jackson was actually considered to direct it, and Russell Crowe was attached to star as Tyler. Ooh, um, when the studio was looking at like who can play the narrator, uh, they were looking at Sean Penn and Matt Damon. And I think, I think Damon could have been okay, been. Um, and mm-hmm. Sean Penn would have been okay. But I think like Norton just knocks it out of the park because he plays that awkward person as it is, mm-hmm. and I think he does a great job in like getting that character through. Um, there's just a lot of symbolism in it. It's a, it's a movie that has to be watched several times to understand. I know that's a turnoff for a lot of Absolutely. people. That, why would you want to watch it? It's just more of a psychological movie where things happen, and then you wonder: Is this person real? Is that person real? Is this what, what, what's the point of this? What the hell's going on? Um, it definitely did not occur to me it, it that he, they were two different people. It just and and maybe that's because I wasn't paying attention enough. I felt like I was, but there was just so much going on. It like until he kind of basically said it mm. i had no idea like I just because they never... do so well playing sorry tony they do no, no, so no, no. well of like ha- being so different from each other i was like there's no way this is like the same person do you think the ending could have been better i think there's a lot of things about this movie that could have been better. <laughs> um but you yeah, know, Marty, the, I'll be honest with you. This would be like, you know, I, I this is like I could understand with this movie. We're seven. That's mm-hmm. why, you know, when it was like, let's put this list together, put Fight Club at the top. If you were asking me personally off camera, I would have been like, are you sure you want to put this at the top? Because this is one that it takes. It takes. And not only that, but you might. 
never get it. I mean, some people get it and some people, mm-hmm. you know, but you said it's it's very hyped. It's a very hyped movie. Um, yeah. A lot of and people like, will pick this over seven, which is really confusing to me. Yeah, but, that is odd to me as but, well. But uh, I mean, CPG did it. I will say he did a great job of helping me explain the movie to the point because like when the movie ended, I was like, what the fuck was the plot of this movie? Like, what was the <laughs> point? Like, it's some like, and sometimes it's kind of nice. Some people like that. Some people like going into a movie, not being pre- it's not predictable. Cause like as, as much as seven, like seven was largely predictable at a certain oh, point, even though there's obviously that big twist at the end, but like same with silence of the lambs, like you, you pretty much know like where your end result's going to be. When I started watching this, I was like, there's no, kind of like a napoleon dynamite kind of thing there's not really like a firm plot to the movie it's just like yeah i was telling andrew i'm like these this movie's just guys being dudes like they're just fighting each other and just like they're not really like doing anything and then only after like the fact of having it explained like with you know tyler is the narrator's like what he wants to be kind of thing. It reminded me of the movie uh, Secret Life of Walter Mitty, actually, as mm-hmm. weird as it, when he kind of like daydreams mm-hmm. Mitty in the movie and there's just this, com- he's this completely different person and is kind of living the life that he wants to live. I feel like that's kind of the marriage with uh, Edward Norton and Brad Pitt in the movie is that Brad Pitt might not be like, exactly the person he wants to be but it's definitely a better like a a more better version to him of it so like a kind of a happy marriage would have been ideal for him i feel like (laughs) some say that sam some say we are the same person we are we're avatars one of us is (laughs) behind the curtain (laughs) yes but uh i'm I'm right with you. Uh, what did you think of Meatloaf's performance in the movie as Bob with his uh, special chest that he had in the movie? Excellent. Before? It was <laughs> good. Like I felt, I it's like he definitely had like when they're doing the um, when they're in the support groups. Mm. You know, I feel like he liked the movie too. Um, <laughs> I feel like there's just the embrace. I feel like it was felt, and like I can definitely think not getting away from Meatloaf's character, but the idea of Edward Norton's character in general is largely like very relatable. Just kind of the idea that we're all just, you know, victim is a very harsh word, but like we're kind of just subject to whatever we're being fed, and you know, we like to think we have a say in things, and like we we do now more so than before. But like just this idea of like we're not ever content. We're always wanting to seek more, that kind of thing. I feel like this movie did a good job of talking about how we can move away from being materialistic to more of like a experience-based lifestyle, which yeah, I think I is important. Definitely agree with all of that. Mm-hmm. Well, Rox, you know, you're not the only person that really didn't enjoy it at first. Uh, when this film came out, Rosie O'Donnell used to have her morning talk show. And she hated this film to the point where she spoiled the ending on her show. Oh <laughs> well, it was still in theaters. That's how much she hated it. Uh, oh. So, well, now I have to like it because I feel like agreeing <laughs> with Rosie O'Donnell about anything is just <laughs> like I have to just. I, this is a great movie, my favorite movie now. I love it so much. I'm so glad that you had me watch this. Thank you. Yes, and uh, <laughs> Roxy O'Donnell, they called you. Um, I want to say this part. There's two parts that stick out to me in the film when I rewatched it. Uh, the first is the fact that when she when she first calls him on the phone, he's in a new house, and mm-hmm. Brad Pitt's in the back with nunchucks, just like screaming. Yeah. Him. Oh man, that was so funny. <laughs> yeah, that's a hilarious scene. And then the second part, like I totally forgot about, is when he's doing his meditation and he goes and sees a spirit animal. It's just a penguin and says, "Come oh, with me." <laughs> it's, it's <definitely laughs> but I did. I was- I, Go ahead. To, I'm so sorry. Tony. No, I was just gonna say I, was, I always just like the part where um, he grabs uh, her and he goes. I when they're like pretending um, in the he's like I need this, you tourist. He <laughs> calls her that or whatever. Just a lot of good one-liners in the movie, you know. Really. Mm-hmm. And then I was just gonna mention this is the second, well, third movie if you count Mr. and Mrs. Smith. But like we were talking about with Seven, part of the reason I picked this movie one is to see about the hype. But then two, see another Brad Pitt movie that's, you know, understandably within reason, like fairly different than Seven, just in regards to the Mm -hmm. type of character. You know, he's very quirky. 
he's almost kind of what is that where he's got like a like he likes pain inflicted on him. Yeah. He has like are, that are we weird sticking with Brad Pitt with these poles? Should we pick just going with? Oh God, no! Picks? I need to take a break. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. But like, I like seeing the contrast in yeah. uh, in his acting performance, yeah. and I think that really helps me appreciate him more as an actor. Just because like any of those guys, I hadn't seen anything he was in, admittedly, before, and so now I feel like I have a better understanding of just how he plays his characters, and I think he's a really good actor. Very awesome. Yeah, definitely. Uh... He doesn't really. He, well, now he's getting more of a uh, recognition for his acting, uh, but yeah, definitely like one uh, a good Brad Pitt movie. If you ever want to get back into Brad Pitt, California, it's a really good Ooh. with a K. That's a really good movie. Um, but yeah, definitely he's he's a, a talented actor. Uh, so this is your second Fincher film. Like, do you want to keep exploring David Fincher, or would you want to like take a break and try something new? See, it's funny because like I thought these movies were so different. Like that, it I wouldn't even like when I I don't have that movie kind of knowledge that you guys possess where I can watch it and be like, oh, it's this is clearly like a David Fincher movie. I mean, I would know that because it's fucking raining in all of these movies. Um, that seems to be the only thing that I can point out that is comparable is that they're just raining. But I'm good, honestly. That the point of this is to just expand my horizons in general, and so I think you guys have obviously like a better grasp on what that all entails because like it, it's like you don't know what you don't know and so like that's where i'm at i don't know what i don't know so if there's something you want to give me a recommendation you want the people to decide i kind of like the people deciding every so often that's personally cool. cool. but i'm good with whatever you guys suggest i have i have genuinely enjoyed all the movies that you've recommended so it's not like i'm sitting here being like i, I hate <laughs> i hate this yeah so, so i mean it's think? I think it's just I just love that segment because it just gives me like a like it makes me think of what I was thinking when I first saw the movie. And if you don't like it, it doesn't mean that you don't you're wrong. It's everybody's oh, yeah, yeah. you know view subjunctive. Like it doesn't it, you know it's subjective. I mean it doesn't really matter. It's like what you like, what you like. I mean there's movies that I like that Tony doesn't like. Yeah. And vice versa, you know. My favorite uh, thing is just sitting on the couch and watching Katie not like the movie I like, <laughs> just so I can hear that opposite side, so I can try to understand why it maybe isn't good or good. What yeah, is UHF? What is oh, I don't want to put her through that. UHF is a Weird Al movie. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. Um, <laughs> it's with Michael Michael Richards is actually in there, and also the the Donger from uh, uh, Sixteen Candles is in there. The Donger. Yeah, I, I'm, have you ever seen Sixteen Candles? That'd be a good one. What about The Breakfast Club? I've seen that. Okay. I have seen. Uh, that. We're gonna have to think about. Uh, it depends on what yeah. you feel like doing. If we're you want to do like other, we'll, yeah. and, and we'll, we'll yeah. come up with something new for you. We might put a poll out. See, uh, yeah. See, Jen tells me oh, I don't wow. like the, I don't like most of the movies. Jump has me watch if I can stay awake. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. And then when we first started dating, you choose movies like Harold, which is about a kid that's balding at like twelve with Cuba Gooding oh, Jr. as his, oh, as his best come friend. On. Come on, I, I, I sat down and Katie had me watch one day a long time ago, uh, win a date with Tad Hamilton. And oh. I was like, you know, at the end of the day, there's a couple laughs in this. It, I could be worse. I could be working. You know, oh, I mean, dude. You know, things like that. It's an ongoing joke <laughs> between me and Jen because we were watching it. And like, it's so like, Cooper Gooden Jr. plays his janitor. It takes the kid under his wing and the kids literally got oh, like a receding know, hairline. Oh, yeah. Oh, Jen's I love you. I'm looking at it right now. It says the box office it didn't even make 14 grand, and it cost yeah. 3.5 million dollars to make. And I bet you, a large portion of that was photoshopping this kid's hair. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So I mean, it's just a joke we have between us because we were like, it's "What the hell funny. are we watching?" Um, but yeah, man. Uh, we'll think of something to get you. Maybe, might, maybe we might do a switch over to a comedy you haven't seen. Oh. And do something a little different to get you into a funnier. Uh, to feel good. All right. Yeah. Rick, what is uh? What is Brian? I keep hearing about this movie. Is it Rick Requiem Requiem for a Dream? Oh, Requiem for a Dream. Requiem. Yeah, that's, a, that's a. If you're really looking for a good time after a long day, put that on. Yeah. If you want to. Oh my goodness. Requiem for a Dream. It's. You know what? How about if you really want to go with like if well, we can prep you like start with it if you want to start with like uh a movie that's kind of like requiem for a dream look up okay. less than zero lust and zero yeah lust and zero 
Yeah, it's by the same guy who wrote uh, American Psycho. Oh. No. Oh. Brad, Brad oh. Easton Ellis. Okay, cool. I'll have What's to... real hilarious is that you were saying lust than zero, oh, and yeah. I was like, oh, wait a minute. I got to watch a movie here. I've yeah, that, okay. And that's exactly, like, oh, that's also me. what I thought you were saying, and I'm glad that we. Yeah, oh, yeah. Scott, so Robert Downey Jr. Alice, you know, oh, James Spader's in it. I like James Spader. <laughs> yeah, Spader. that's a pretty good movie, too. <laughs> Brian's like, don't watch it, Roxy. You, you also <laughs> just watch this one, and then if you want to continue to go down the rabbit hole, we can watch. No, but don't don't jump into that movie. Don't like get off like, of this and put that. What on. the it's requiem so from it for a dream? Both. Either one, don't please. Both. I'm oh. telling you, this is not. This won't leave you with like uh, your yeah no. The not, movie not yet. Not there yet. has We're been there, one, <laughs> there has been one movie that I've watched that uh, I had to take breaks during it. And then I was like, I will probably like comfortably never watch this again. And it's Parasite. Nope. Oh, Parasite. <laughs> no, That's Parasite. Movie, yeah. I, yeah, I I just, that was a lot. That was a heavy movie for me. Uh, um, yeah. So I guess it was as long as it's not like Parasite. I can... No, no, it's more of a, <laughs> it's a heavy movie, but not in that way. It's a different kind of heavy. Yeah. This Check that one out. Re Requiem or the other one? Well, you know. Either one. Yeah, either one. If you want, right. we can put it for a poll. I, I think Less Than Zero is like a little bit more watered down version of Requiem. This movie's good. Okay. Bug. You ever see Bug? Bug's pretty good. <laughs> Bug sounds gross. It's uh, like, what is that? Oh, what is that movie? Oh, it's got Jeff Goldblum in it. Oh my god, Roxy. So uh I hope I hope Jen's still watching this. So Jen, my wife, like love her to death. She'll watch any movie I watch with her. Yeah. I was telling her about a Jeff Goldblum movie. I'm like, um, have you like we were watching Jurassic Park? I think I'm like, have yeah. you ever seen like a Judd Goldblum movie without him in Jurassic Park. And she's like, all I know is that one movie, Bug. <laughs> like, The Fly? And she's like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, that movie. And then Dude. this Bug, the movie Bug came out that Dougie's talking about. And Dougie's wife walked out of this movie. That's why he's he's suggesting it. Holy sh <laughs> But yeah. uh, she saw Whoa. that and she's like, oh my oh, god, it's a real movie. Oh, oh, this is gross. Dude, uh, yeah, The Fly is probably one of the most disgusting movies I've ever seen. And, uh, I mean, Jeff Goldblum's, that's a daddy right there, but I am just, no, that's okay. That's okay. And you know what's a, another really, just on this before I go, I'm not trying to keep you from No, here, no, 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 like, no, 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 no. What is this, what is this movie called? Uh, Slither? Oh, oh yeah, that's a good one. That's so um, we, James yeah. Bond. I mean, it's it's very uh, as you said, gross. Probably. Yeah, like, we watched that stuff. movie like when it came out. It was like one of those on. Just I don't think it was like if it was in theaters, we just watched it on TV. Like my aunt had TiVo, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we were watching on that. The one barn scene where that chick eats like the raccoon or oh, something. Yeah. Yeah. I still think about that and get <laughs> grossed out. Like I. Like it's been almost twenty years, and I still think about that movie and get a little gross, gross out. So nothing like that. Not that's that's where I draw the hard line. But if it means I watch a, Re is it Requiem? I'm sorry. Yeah, Requiem. Requiem. Yes, yes. Watching Requiem for a Dream to avoid any of those gross <laughs> movies, then I'll do it. Yeah, Slit. Well, you know James Gunn, who directed uh, Slither, he actually used to work for Tromaville, and they uh, Lloyd Kaufman, who's the creator of a Toxic Avenger. Like, I don't know if you know, it's like a horrible, uh, campy 80s horror comedy movie. Um, mm -hmm. they kind of had like that's their humor. Like, and he was, he's from that school. He, he was, he wrote a movie called Tromeo and Juliet, which is about a mutant <laughs> and a girl. Like, it's how ridiculous their stuff is. And then James Gunn worked on that and then he <laughs> did Slither. Um, so that's kind of why it's gross like that because he was just coming out of this trauma, the, uh, you know, little seating, but. Yeah, definitely a disgusting movie. But if you want to watch something that's kind of based off like a book and has aliens in space, like Brian suggested a great movie too in Starship Troopers. Classic. Very good movie. That, Doogie Howser's in it. Um, oh, no. Yeah. These are serious movies, right? No, Starship Troopers is not in the movie. No, yeah, I mean, it has okay. a lot of symbolism, but it's not. What's not the one serious. where you comb through the desert? Where you. Or uh, space balls. Yeah, space balls. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so how about That's we do like... this, Tone? Right. We have a pull with uh, Requiem. Okay. We'll just throw space balls on there. We'll throw. Uh, we'll no, not throw... space. 
in space oh. ball. Okay. <laughs> the other one. Uh, Less than zero? No, Starship <laughs> Troopers. Starship Troopers. Troopers, yes. Yeah. So Requiem, Starship Troopers. Just make get it real fucking I, weird. Just I will go in all we'll different like directions. We'll get there. UHF. You throw UHF on. Oh yeah, and then we'll throw something at the end. It's yeah. just completely yeah, out. Nothing yeah. like. Uh, I don't want people to feel like there's one definite pick. I like. I like that. They gotta go. They gotta not know what to pick. I like it. Yeah, we can. Uh, we can definitely come up with that. Uh, for the poll. I mean, so eventually long. we'll watch all of them anyway. But. <laughs> Yeah, I I, just, I love the fact too that CPG is kind of like your translator for movies you don't understand. Oh, like, it's so great! Like, as so when I watch movies, okay. so maybe maybe this is gonna this is either gonna make people hate me or they don't care. I read the Wikipedia plot before I watch movies because I am more concerned personally with how it unfolds instead of what unfolds. Um, that's just kind of how my my brain just likes. Uh, like I'm too antsy for the conclusion. So I just want to know what happens. And then I enjoy seeing how it all plays out, but it's really nice just watching the sh- movies with him. Cause I can ask him like 800 questions and he'll just answer all of them. Cause he's seen the movie like seven fucking times. Um, but it's just nice. Instead of being like somebody being like, no, no, just like wait and see what happens. He just tells me it feels like a love language that we've worked out, but that it does help because for this movie going back to fight club, I had a, uh, a greater appreciation for it than when I was d- done initially watching it. I was, I went from like, meh to like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's always good to have that. Per- I mean, Jen does the same thing to me. Like she asked me a lot of questions. Um, you guys are good. If you just answer them. You're the yeah, best. That's, I always, well, I think I just usually say them before she can even ask sometimes. I'm like, did you know that so-and-so I'm like a Wikipedia page sitting next to you. <laughs> Shut up. Be quiet. You've said too much. That's how I feel. <laughs> Yeah, but um, Rox, uh, thanks for coming on. We you know we really appreciate. It. We'll put that poll up to get you, uh, you know, in your next segment. Uh, do you got anything to plug? No, we're doing good. Just everybody's. We got Yumpin going to be in the one hundred and eight tournament. Obviously, myself. We got a bunch of ass crew. We got so many of the bums getting in there. So just make sure that you're picking the right people. And uh, just excited for the next episode. Thank you so much again for having me. This is truly like this is truly like a really fun experience, and I'm glad we're doing this. Wow. Yeah. Thanks, wow. Rex. Thank awesome. You. Catch you guys later. See ya. Yeah. No, I really like that segment with Rex. And when she when she suggested it, like, oh, is, you know, would that be kind of cool? I was like, definitely, because for one, Rex is pretty funny. Watch movies who's never seen a movie, you yeah. can just send them our way because we'll give you movies. And she was definitely stepped right up and said she'd love to do this and it's mm-hmm. awesome yeah also check out uh the ass cast uh roxy does the uh with the all sports scene they do it every thursday at seven uh yeah, the, the last main guy time. the main guy on that show um if you don't know him um he, well first of all he's named after a famous superhero but he also likes just really he might even like better movies than me he likes this ben affleck movie at uh Rhymes with Lily. I think it's Geely or something. But yeah, definitely check those guys out. Really awesome. Yeah, their last episode was hilarious, especially when they got to their uh, tweet of the week. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, but um, so that's a uh, Roxy segment. Never seen it. Uh, we're gonna go straight into our um, main event, as we say. We're gonna go into the Oscars tone. We're gonna talk some Oscars here. Uh, so like we, I kind of gave a little brief introduction of how I feel about the Oscars. You know, I. I'm a huge movie nerd, as you can see. I know you are too. And it's just like, uh, it's kind of like sometimes watching it, I'm like, man, I watch it for who wins and I watch it for like the little skits. And to be honest with you, I do watch it for to see how they do the memoriam yeah. uh, of the people yeah. who, the great actors and, you know, producers and everyone who's passed in the film industry. Um, like, so was an Oscar thing like night, like a big thing for you? Because I know I've gone to Oscar parties. I, I mean, it was a big thing with my mom and my dad. We watched it, you know, when it came out, my brother. Um, what about for you? Do you guys, is it like a big thing for you growing up? Uh, really? Yes. Number one. Yes. Number two, really, really cool before, you know, we joined together here at the sadistic penguin studios, you guys were doing like a live Oscar, um, stream. And honestly, I sat and watched the whole thing with you guys and it was a blast and uh, that's when I knew your passion and how much you love this. And myself, um, you know, I've watched, I think, every single year. 
Um, that's why I can, in my head, chug out the next 15 episodes we can do for the next 15 years, and they'll all be different just by how much information is in all these shows. There's, there's just so much that we can't even cover in a time period. So I'm excited to see what this is going to happen this year. Yeah, definitely. Um, just something in the comments. Uh, Brian said, he, hey, guys, something I forgot to mention when you were talking about funny people. Adam Sandler turned down Eli Roth's role in Inglorious Bastards to do funny people. Uh, that's totally true. Uh, Adam Sandler has true. come out and said that Quentin Tarantino told him he had a role for him as the uh, the bear Jew in Inglorious Bastards that was specifically written for Adam Sandler. Uh, unfortunately, he was doing uh, funny people with Judd Apatow and he told Quentin, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, I'm doing this film. And Quentin was totally cool with it. But um, he said it killed him to like not be able to do that part in the film. That's, that's true. That's very true. And as Brian said, nobody will be watching the Oscars because they're going to be watching the uh, drafty pod and uh, get one of these beautiful shirts. They feel really nice. Um, but, you know, that being said, you know, the Oscars, uh, again, just a lot of stuff going on. Um, this year feels a lot more like a real oscar year than the a couple of years prior maybe it could just be me maybe it's because of how big some of these movies were this year it feels like there's a lot of stakes going on and i'm excited to talk about these yeah it's a like there's a lot of heavyweight of uh, you know films in this uh just a couple little you know tidbits before we get into the nominees of, and categories uh it's a year of grown-ups at the Oscars. For the first time since 1931, every acting nominee is over the age of 30. Wow. Uh, Brooks being the youngest and De Niro at 34 and De Niro being the oldest at 80. Ooh. So that's pretty crazy. Um, this is also the first year that two folks in the same year, actors and producers, Bradley Cooper for Maestro and Emma Stone for Poor Things, have earned nominations for both picture and leading acting awards. Oh, very awesome. Also, Killers of the Flower and Moon has brought uh, also brought a new best to supporting actor contender, Robert De Niro, who has now boasted a record 12 credited roles in a best picture nominee. He is co-star in the film, and Leonardo DiCaprio is second on that list with 11. Hmm. Those are you know it's 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 as you sit back and listen to some of these you're just shocked especially leonardo dicaprio you know it's hmm. just how time flies definitely uh i remember him on growing pains oh, yeah. um, yeah. uh and then it's two more little tidbits uh never have there been never have three female directors in one year earned best picture nominations for their work until justin justine treat of autonomy of the fall uh greta gerwig of barbie and Celine's song of past lives came along. So it's the first time three female directors actually had their movies up for best picture, which I think is awesome. Um, and then the last thing in uh, John Williams talking about old told everybody, hold his beer. He's 91 and he's the oldest to ever compete for an Oscar. Uh, the record he set last year was 90. So he's breaking his own record. Um, for his work on the Fable Wins. Uh, my brother's giving me crap right now about Bob De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio uh, and Daniel Day-Lewis. He uh, he thinks that they're they're better actors than Day Daniel Day-Lewis, but that's an argument to have another day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's some, like, just little, little, like, tidbits that we have of the Oscars this year. So a very big year for people. Uh, you also know that Spielberg's been nominated. You got these heavyweights, like you said, it's like a big, you know, big, big, news surrounding all these great films uh but uh let's get into our first category tom let's do it so we're going to be talking about the first category is the best supporting actress category and the nominees for that are emily blunt for oppenheimer danielle brooks who was the youngest candidate for uh, an award for the color purple um she's also was one of the few people to be nominated for a uh a tony award for a film like other people, like Mark Ruffalo had one Tony Award, Carrie Mulligan has one, Freddie Cooper has one, Danielle Brooks has one. Um, Brooks this year joins an exclusive club of actors only for both Tony Awards and Academy Award awards for the same role. In Brooks' case, Sophia in The Color Purple. Uh, so she has a role for both those, a role that was uh, nominated for both a Tony Award and an Oscar, which is kind of cool. Uh, you have America Ferreira for Barbie, uh, Jodie Foster for Niad. I think that's how you say it. Uh, Jodie Foster was nominated for Best Supporting Actress for this film, has nearly as long as a gap between her last nomination for Best Supporting Actor 
in 1977's Taxi Driver. And then lastly, rounding it off is Divine Joy Randolph for The Holdovers. So out of these candidates, Tone, who do you got for this Oscar? Okay, um, I've seen all the performances here. Um, I'm I'm really, really big on one particular performance out of all of them, and that is uh, Divine Joy Randolph in The Holdovers. Um, Really huge fan of her performance in this movie. Not saying the other ones were not good. Um, I've heard different things um, about some of the other performances. Um, You know, there are always quotes that are said kind of like online. Like people have their own, you know, their own Oscar opinions. Here's an opinion that I think uh, I'm going to ask you how you feel that I read today. And I kind of, I said it out loud to my wife and she kind of got a little bit upset. Um, It was, you know, any actress that is going to be getting a nomination pretty much from um, Christopher Nolan should be really, really glad because his um, dialogue is awful. And, you know, Emily Blunt should just be lucky that she's even considered because she stunk in the movie. Do you agree with that? Did you see? Uh, Yes, I saw Oppenheimer and I don't think I think Emily Blunt was actually uh, one of the best parts of Oppenheimer. She Mm. was really good chemistry Mm. with uh, with uh, Cillian Murphy, Uh, Cillian Murphy. But, you know, I mean, everybody has their own opinion. And like my opinion is that correct. Wait wait till I got five more of these for you (laughs) as we go along. You might be hot by the end. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, But um, no, I think she was excellent in the film. Uh, I think she added a lot of layers to it. Um, to me, I think uh, Divine Joy Randolph should take this, no doubt. Uh, I thought The Holdovers was a great film. Um, we'll get more to it when we get to the Best uh, best Actor category. Mm-hmm. But uh, I thought it was excellent. Um, I thought Emily Blunt was excellent. America Ferreira, I, I think she was okay in Barbie. Um, then again, I didn't really enjoy Barbie, I, like everybody else did. I thought it was okay. Uh, I think it was like a little bit overhyped when I would see it finally. Um, and I thought Jodie Foster was great in her film. Uh, but yeah, I have to give it to for America Ferrera because I go all the way back to the premiere of Ugly Betty. Mm-hmm. My mom would watch Ugly Betty, and I would just remember her from that and to see how far she's come to be nominated. But you know, um, you know, I, I don't think it's pretty much, uh, you know, I don't think it's something that uh, what's the word I'm looking for? People, you know, it's a good role, you know, but I don't know if it's going to be the one that's going to win. No way. How are you? I just voted. I just said uh, a woman should have won. Uh, should have won. What are you talking <laughs> it's about? Because of Barbie. It's because uh, of Barbie. Barbie. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I, still, I, I love uh, Margaret Robbie. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, and great, I, lo- I like, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Ryan Gosling. I love Ryan Gosling. It, yeah. it just it didn't, I don't know, it just didn't resonate with me like it did everybody else. But I mean, that, it happens. Uh, but yeah, I, I like I deal with you with, um, uh, with uh, about um, Merca Ferreira. I think she's an excellent actress, though. Uh, but yeah, I, I, if I, if I had to choose, like my second would probably be Emily Blunt, like because I love her acting in Oppenheimer. Um, but yeah, Divine Joy Randolph knocked it out of the ballpark for me. Um, Jodie Foster again, always great performances. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my wife was saying something earlier. She kind of lost her voice, and I even said, brought up the movie Nell. You ever see Nell mm-hmm. with Jodie Foster? Yeah. Um, you know, Jodie Foster does a lot of different work back to Taxi Driver. That's probably where I saw her first or really remember her to see a, a career um, and to be considered even. I think a lot of people get confused that, you know, winning, yes, is great. But even to be considered as the five greatest supporting actresses of the year, it's pretty awesome. So, yeah. Um, but definitely. yeah, I, I would agree with you as Emily Blunt is second. Yeah, uh, and Dougie, uh, this season, I'm clueless about a bunch of flicks, which is fine, man. Like, uh, sometimes there's films that I can't even get yeah. to for Oscars. There's just so many to oh, yeah. ingest. Get uh, them especially... to them later or get yeah. to them after. It's just, you know, not yeah. a lot of people see them. So a lot of, I think I did a study sometime that it's a lot of people see the movies after, and that's when they put them back in the movie theaters and, you know, and all of that. Too. Yeah, like Shawshank. They got nominated for so yeah. many awards, and people were like, "Why is it getting nominated?" And then the rentals went out. You know, the rentals yeah. and the, it true. blew up that way. Um, Air was snubbed. He definitely was. Uh, then he had to do that horrible movie, Golden Retriever. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna go into our next category, which is the best supporting actor, and the uh, nominees for that one is Sterling K. Brown for American Fiction, Robert De Niro for Killers of the Flower Moon, 
Ooh, uh, well, it's okay. Yeah, I think I might have gave you the wrong order. It's no, no, problem. you're fine. No, you're good. Um, it's me. It's no, no. Robert De Niro and Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, if De Niro wins this Best Supporting Actor for Killers of the Flower Moon, it'll be his second career win in the category. Uh, the first being in The Godfather Two, and as well as in uh, Raging Bull, um, which would give him uh, three Oscars, which is a big thing because you know that guy Daniel Day Lewis, he's history. Uh, but it's also forty nine years apart. Since he was nominated for uh, the Godfather Two, which is his first nomination, um, also has Robert Downey Jr. in Al- Oppenheimer, uh, Ryan Gosling in Barbie, and Mark Ruffalo in Poor Things. Uh, so, Tone, which one of these movies, uh, these um, actors for Best Supporting Actor, do you have? The atomic bomb. He wanted to be the man who moved the Earth. He talks about putting the nuclear genie back in the bottle. Uh, I'm gonna have to go with Robert Downey Jr. Um, um, I but that's not taking away from Mark Ruffalo, Gosling, De Niro, or Sterling K. Brown because honestly, they all did a great. They all for me, they all did a really good job. Um, but again, to me, Downey Jr. and I'm and for me, I'm really actually shocked at how much I enjoyed Oppenheimer because I put it off until about two weeks ago um, when it was on. Um, peacock because honestly i thought it was just going to be uh uh, here we go you know blah 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 but honestly it was not like that at all um killers of the flower moon with de niro he's really good at it too um here's another quote from the quote uh machine here um yump i'm curious at what you think of this quote here um where did it go here oh here it is uh would you say if somebody was to tell you that Robert Downey Jr.'s performance in Oppenheimer was the 15th best performance in the movie out of all the performances in the movie, would you take this movie film person seriously? Yes or no? Again. Uh... And how about how about and then following after and saying, I don't think he should ever win an award because he's not a good actor. What would you think of this? This this Because I read it, and I also, anger struck through me. I was curious of what you would think of something like this. Yeah, I disagree. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I, the best thing I can do is this. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I like I said, it's uh, subjective. It I disagree. Movies um, are subjective. Josh Peck is in Oppenheimer. My brother just texted me, Josh Peck's in Oppenheimer. He is. He's awesome in it. Uh, yes. but yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Um, my let me just get my pick out of the way. I'm I, I so I went to Killers of a Flower when I finally saw the film, and I actually saw it yesterday. I haven't gotten around to it, and me and Jen sat down and watched it. Um, love the film, it's a film that I probably won't watch, uh, more than once or twice because uh, it's very hard watch and it kind of made me mad, <laughs> uh, um, because of the story with it. I thought. Robert De Niro, you know, Robert De Niro is a champion of a lot of people. Daniel Day Lewis, that's his, that's his guy. You know, that's who he aspired to be. You know, I, he's when it comes to acting, you can go look no further than when you hear the name Robert De Niro. I thought he was excellent in Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, the only reason I'm going Downey Jr. over him is because I think Downey Jr.'s character was more complex than Robert De Niro, uh, and I think it has to do with the story as well to help that. But in Oppenheimer. You find you think that Downey Jr.'s character is somebody that's helping people, yeah. And you find out as a movie goes on, he's not. De Niro kind of just puts it straight out there. He's kind of an asshole. <laughs> yeah, right from the get go. <laughs> yeah, um, Ryan Gosling though. I mean, honestly, uh, I saw someone <laughs> earlier say that uh, Ryan Gosling should have won for um, Nice Guys. You know, he was really good in that. You know, I mean, Brian Gosling's good in Barbie. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's an Oscar-nominated oh, role? I, I think so. I mean, see, the, like, for that role and that type of role, like, those roles do deserve the recognition. I mean, going back, if you want to talk about a role that was kind of out there that got nominated, look at Robert Downey Jr.'s nomination for Tropic Thunder. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it was I totally forgot about that. Totally number. outside the realm of, you know, and say what you will about you know the optics of it now and back then, but the fact that he was nominated for a role like that for an Oscar, 
like that that opens the doors for the Ryan Gosling's roles, you know, and and Barbie. Like, I thought he he's the best part of Barbie besides Margaret Robbie. I mean, those are two stars of the film, but you know that I loved him and he was great in it. I just the movie just didn't resonate that much with me, but I thought he was, you know, he just totally deserves to be there. Another great actor that doesn't get enough recognition is Ryan Gosling. Yeah, he definitely does. Uh, Mark Ruffalo's um, Poor Things. This movie it just dropped on Hulu today. Um, again. He does a pretty good job in the movie, you know. But again, to me, it didn't the performance didn't rise to the heights of of Downey Jr.'s. Sterling yeah. Brown also, who I love, is a really awesome actor. Great movie, you know. Um, you know, I I, I just no, you know, I, I have to go with Downey Jr. Yeah, Sam says he thought De Niro should have gotten a Razzie. <laughs> so Sam and Sam, I mean, he could Sam could be serious, or to me, like. We can talk about more with the best actor. That's kind of how I felt about Leo's acting in that film. Yeah, sure. um, and I, I think Leo, Di- Leo Di- Di- DiCaprio is an excellent actor. He's probably one of the best. Uh, I think he's, uh, you know, put out of a pedestal higher than others than he should be. But I think he's excellent. But I think he was like I, his acting in that film just didn't resonate with me. And he wasn't nominated for an award, which I can understand why. But I, I thought De Niro did a great job. Um, and De Niro has a good, you know, he does plays, he's really, really good at playing bad people. <laughs> you know, Max oh, Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, even uh, Vito Corleone. Vito Corleone wasn't a great person. No. Um, but, you know, he Max Cady sticks out, you know, uh, Jake the LaMotta, you know, he's good at bringing out those emotions of you hating him. Do you ever see Angel Heart? Yes, he plays the devil. Yes, Lou Cipher. I love that name in that movie. <laughs> oh, we were not kidding. De Niro was a bad net movie. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got. I'm pretty sure my my feelings resonate the same for Leo. Uh, we are not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I love Stu. We're not kidding. I know, that was pretty good. Um, yes, Lionheart. I see Lionheart. That's my man, yeah. John Claude Van Damme. Classic. <laughs> it was a um, so uh, that's our best supporting actor role. Let's get into our best actress in a leading role. All right. Let's get just so. Best Actress in a Leading Role, the nominees are Annette Bedding for Niad, Lily Gladstone for Killers of Flower Moon. Uh, she's considered the heart and soul of the movie and became the first Native American indigenous person to be nominated for a lead actress role. Uh, Sandra Huller of Atomy of Fall. Uh, she was a star of the Best Picture nominee, Atomy of Fall, is the first German-born, German-born actress to earn a nomination in 86 years. Luis Rayner in 1938's The Good Earth was the last, which I think is crazy. Uh, Carrie Mulligan for Maestro and Emma Stone for Poor Things. Tone, who you got in this one? Well, I think, you know, honestly, I think it's a pretty tied up category. And there it is right there. Lily Gladstone, you know, I think does an, an amazing, amazing, amazing performance in, in the movie. I think, you know, she does a really, really good job. Um that being said, let's go to the same person who's got something else really interesting to say about Lily Gladstone. Um, you know, uh, not saying she was bad in the movie or even mid, but uh, do you really think that her performance should be a top five performance out of all these performances? Where it's yeah. like, I get, I Carrie Mulligan and Maestro, I know. Um, Emma Stone, she's pretty good in the poor things, but again, it's a different kind of movie than Killers of the Flower Moon. You said it yourself. The movie's a difficult, you know, subject matter. It's hard to get in there. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I don't I don't know if you're reading this stuff on Reddit or <laughs> what, but uh I totally uh, disagree on that one too. Uh Lily Gladstone, uh, I think um take out the historical significance of her being nominated. Mm-hmm. Uh, was like her acting, like you felt a lot of emotion with the way she was in the film. Uh, her, you know, her, you felt empathy and you know, you felt sadness for her, just like what she was going through in the trials and tribulations her family was going through. Uh, I thought, you know, the way she was playing when she was sick, like you feel bad for her, you don't know what's going to happen unless you know the historical context of the character. Then, I mean, but as somebody going fresh in, is she gonna live? Is she gonna die? You will know, and you know it. And I think, even though I said Leo wasn't his probably his best role, I thought her chemistry with him was excellent. Yeah. Um. And 
you know, and she, the funny thing about her is she was actually signing up for a data analytics course before, you know, this movie, she got this role. She didn't, she was very, very not getting, you know, dry in terms of getting roles. Uh, she thought the well was drying up for her. She wasn't getting any roles. So she's like, maybe I should do something different. Maybe it's time to move on. She was signing up for a data analytics course when she got a ping. This is during a course, um, COVID. She got a ping from uh, market, Mark Scorsese's secretary saying, hey, he wants to meet you. Uh, they did a Zoom call and she was offered a role, uh, which I think is like awesome. Uh, she totally deserves this award. Uh, I thought Emma Stone was great in Poor Things. Uh, again, different type of movie. Uh, I thought uh, Carrie Mulligan was great in Maestro. Uh, so was Sandra. I, I think all the people who actually got nominated were excellent. I just think that Lily Gladstone set the standard in this year's Best Actress Award. I think she totally deserves to be to win. Yeah, and I don't think really it's up for any debate that she's not. I don't really see anything that or heard anything that not. But uh, what Trish? <laughs> Break the walls down. <laughs> Yeah, Dougie put out Chris Jericho's The Lionheart. <laughs> I know, I heard singing Break the Walls Down is quite a BK uh, song. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought, like I said, Lily just, just knocks it out of the ballpark for me. And I, I, and it's, you know, if you haven't seen the film, see it. And like people say, you know, it's a tough role. Like it's a tough movie to watch. I mean, Schindler's List is tough. And, you know, I thought uh, um, Liam Nielsen up once or twice like you said yeah like Liam Neeson knocked it out of the ballpark for his role you know he did uh, um, as well as uh, Ben Kingsley he knocked yeah. it out of the park you know the, the, it's a hard role but those people those actors deserve to get dominated for the way they portray it um, yeah it's definitely check it out if you haven't seen uh, Kills of the Flower Moon I, I recommend at least watching it once it's on Apple TV for free right now if you have Apple TV uh, but with that, my friend, let's move on to Best Actor in a Leading Role. Let's do it. So nominees for this are Bradley Cooper for Maestro, uh, Colin Domingo for Rustin, Paul Giamatti for The Holdovers, Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer, and Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction. Uh, if Jeffrey Wright wins the Best Actor for American Fiction, he would join an elite group who have won what is known as the Triple Crown of Acting, meaning they've won an Academy Award, an Emmy Award, and a Tony Award. Uh, Wright received an Emmy in 2004 for the miniseries Angels in America and a Tony Award for Angels in America Peristalkia. Only 24 people have achieved this feat. Those who have done it in the most recent years are including Glenda Jackson, Viola Davis, Jessica Lang, Francis McDormand, and Helen Mirren. Uh, I, I think Jer Jeffrey Wright is an excellent actor. I loved him in Boardwalk Empire. He played a character that you really hated. <laughs> Uh, but American Fiction was a great role for him. Um, but Tone, who are you picking out in this film? Hmm, this one again, it's a tough one. Um, for me personally, it was my idea. Uh, it's for me, it's Giamatti. Um, I've always been a big Giamatti fan and uh, definitely, definitely uh, think it's Giamatti, but Killian Murphy definitely deserves uh, credit too. I could see him winning it too. It's, it's tough. It's a tough pick for me. Yeah. So just to knock things out, you know, out of the way, Bradley Cooper as Maestro was awesome. Um, I really liked it. It's a movie he was passionate about. Uh, he actually, I think he went to school to learn how to conduct uh he produced it he loved you know that's a total passion project when i saw killian murphy and oppenheimer you know killian murphy's always a person that's always been on my radar in terms of actor i loved him in 28 days later um loved him in pinky blinders loved him in red eye he's always had those you know roles you know then he played in the course in the batman series of nolan uh, with the as the scarecrow he's always been that actor that has that you know there's something about him and i was really happy he got the least role in oppenheimer uh, i thought he knocked it out of the ballpark um he 100 percent sure was my choice going into this uh then i saw the holdovers <laughs> and why did paul giamatti have to be nominated against killian murphy it's like you know my two favorite things they have to choose between one of them because I think Paul Giamatti deserves an Oscar. Like we talked about in our last show, uh, 
how he should have been even nominated for Sideways. It was one of my beefs with the Academy that year. Uh, if I had to put two roles up, you know, back to back, I would give the slight edge to Killian Murphy. But if Killian doesn't win, even though I want him to win, I sure hope Paul wins. Like it's yeah. I mean, it's not going to be uh, you know for me. If it goes either way, I'm not going to throw my popcorn bucket across the room mm-hmm. because it didn't get picked. Big fat lie should have gotten Jim. Should have turned. He turned blue in that movie. He did. He sure did. Um, is he this year's Jamie Lee Curtis? No, no, no. Uh, Paul Giamatti was really good in the holdovers. Uh, I yeah, I don't think I think Jamie Lee. I don't think to be honest with you, I don't think there's any real people out there that can be the Jamie Lee Curtis. I think everybody was excellent in the uh, the films and roles that we went through. Um, yeah, I don't Did think you really, like yeah. Maestro. I mean, Bradley Cooper and Maestro. I mean. I liked it. Uh, I thought it was a passion project. I love those passion projects, like when they, yeah. you know, and Killers of Flower Moon was a Scorsese flat yeah. passion project. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and same thing with Oppenheimer. Um, I th- he was a passion project. But uh, yeah, I'll go with Killian Murphy. You, you'll go with Paul Giamatti. Yeah. But like I said, if Paul wins, I'll be extremely happy for him because I think he deserves it. Another great underrated actor who's shown he can win uh, Emmys and Golden Globes. <laughs> um, just hasn't got that yet. <laughs> <I know. laughs> hasn't got to that uh that level yet and stoop uh, i hate you for breaking me break oh, here we hit it at the same time yeah. right there. <laughs> uh so the reason i'm laughing i lost my train of thought is because stoop said does jamie lee curry still need special yogurt to poop uh i'm, I'm pretty sure she does for activia call her for the next show we'll <laughs> get her on the horn yeah we'll ask her the hard-hitting questions too <laughs> uh, but yeah um either if paul giamatti wins or killian murphy wins i'll be happy but i'm i hope murphy wins yeah, I mean it's 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 again, you know, even uh Coleman Domingo. I mean, he does a really, really good job mm-hmm. in his role. But again, when you got a crowded, you know, uh just field like this, it's 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 like as you stated, you know. Um, but I definitely think it's gonna go to one of those two if I was do they do betting in Vegas on these? I heard that I they, think they do. I heard they I do. mean they do betting at wrestling, so I'm sorry they do betting on the Oscars. Yeah. Um, um this was a, a good question you ever see american splendor yes that's a good movie a really good, good movie. movie sideways great great movie yeah um we could spend even even his small three minute role in donnie brasco um where yeah. he's sitting on the couch or like you know and you know he's in anything uh private parts you know uh, one the, of my favorite films he's in is uh that's underrated is confidence oh great movie andy garcia yeah. man yeah great movie yeah. but uh so many so many good uh giamatti rolls but again you know we'll have to wait and see when sunday rolls around yep so that's gonna be was maybe we'll be shocked i don't know yeah, yeah. but um is... let's move on to our next category which i'm gonna go into the uh best director oh, category great. here let's and do the nominees are excuse me if i mispronounce the name Ooh, uh, wrong one here again <laughs> okay yeah nominees are the atomy of a fall by justine trent or triet uh, Killers of the Flower Moon by Martin Scorsese. Uh, with this nomination for directing Killers of the Flower Moon, Martin Scorsese cemented his status as a living person with the most Best Director nominations, surpassing the great Steven Spielberg. Scorsese has been nominated for a prize 10 times in, over his career, taking home the award only once for The Departed in 2006. Um, Scorsese also at 81 becomes the oldest nominated director streaking past former title holder john houston who was 79 in the 1986 for prizzy's honor next we have oppenheimer christopher nolan poor things yorgos lathimos and the zone of interest by jonathan glazer uh the zone of interest i believe is a foreign film and uh, uh but so which of these films or which of these directors do you believe should take home the oscar who I believe is going to take home the Oscar is going to be right there. Christopher Nolan, I believe, is going to take it home. Um, there's some really good movies on this list. Again, um, The Zone of Interest is a really awesome movie. The way it's shot, the way it looks. Um, you know, I think Barbie should have been on this list for directing. Yeah, uh, for, I do. Okay. For just the way it looked and the amount of work that had to go into direct that movie uh 
I've seen anatomy of a fall and I think Barbie maybe should have been there, maybe in that place instead. Um, Yorgos is always awesome and just him being nominated is great, but, and Scorsese, um, you know, I asked you last week, I think it was of what your thoughts were of, um, or two weeks ago about, uh, the Irishman. I wasn't as sold on the Irishman as a lot of other people, but the killers of the flower moon, uh, felt like Scorsese brought me back in again, you know, but again, only a one or two time watch where I can watch Cape fear every night. I like Cape fear quite a lot. So it's, I'll go with Christopher Nolan. How about you? Yeah. So uh, for this film, I thought Poor Things has done very well. Uh, I thought Zone of Interest has done very well. Um, Autonomy of Fall was also done very well. And like I said, I think, you know, for this category, I think they should open up to maybe expanding the nominees to maybe eight. Why not? You know, who's it hurting by just yeah. putting three more people down? Because I do them. think uh, Gerwig should have been nominated for Barbie. Uh, beautiful looking film. Yeah. Um, and it's shot very nicely, too. Uh, but looking at the two heavyweights of this is probably Killers of the Flower Moon and Oppenheimer. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon was, to me, very, very beautifully shot. Uh, a lot of landscape views, a lot of the way the uh, the transition between scenes. Uh, but compared to Oppenheimer, I don't think it was um, you know, even comparable in terms of the way it would look. The way, you know, the transition from dialogue, the... the uh, fixation on characters i thought oppenheimer just the way it looked the black and white the way the film was sh- shot in terms of the uh, millimeter of uh, film used for it um you know the the dialogue even though it's, that's more towards screenwriting but i like the dialogue in both films but you know and just just the visuals and vision that nolan put out i think and both are biopics too which is kind of crazy uh yeah. in terms of you know both based off true stories uh just the way he put together pieces together and had everything seen foul you know was i thought was amazing you know the albert einstein the way he pushed that back together the way uh even some people have different perceptions of the robert, the way robert Downey jr's scenes are shot and but he's more from a press standpoint of it being black and white you know about his, or can, people will say well, that's the way he viewed things which it could be as well it's open to interpretation but I love that aspect of it. You know, I love the ending of Oppenheimer when he's in the um, the plane and he's looking at the the uh, the comet, the rocket. Yeah. Go through. That's uh, uh, one of my favorite things. Also, Killers of the Flower Moon and Oppenheimer have awesome, awesome scores. And Great effects. scores. Great scores. And Scorsese always knocks it out of the ballpark with that. Does. Uh, really does. Yeah, I have to go with Christopher Nolan. I, you know, I would give it to him with Scorsese as a... Uh, Second, and, I, and you know what, Dougie? I totally agree. I'm really surprised Scorsese only won once. The funny thing is, for The Departed, he considered that his B movie, and he won. Um, you know, Passion, uh, Passion, not the Passion of the Christ, um, The Temptation of Jesus, although it's a religious Christ, part, yeah, yeah, was a something that wasn't done, you know, a Scorsese this film. That was great, Goodfellas was a great film. Um, we played this game back in college. It was called Edward Forty Hands, where you would tie two forties to your hand, and we sat there and watched uh, the passion, not the passion, uh, the Last Temptation of Christ, because <laughs> Defoe plays Jesus, yeah. David Bowie plays Pontius Pilate, it's ridiculous. Harvey Keitel plays Judas. It's like Goodfellas, but like set in Jesus times. It's ridiculous, but uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Scorsese, I think, should have won for his other role. We can go, you know what? He'll be, he would be a good deep dive to go into one of these days. Yeah, definitely. Because um, he's one of the legendary actors, uh, act directors of all time, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we both went with Oppenheimer. Um, it wouldn't be surprised me if Scorsese sneaks it out, but I think just looking at the, the Golden Globes, Spirit Award, I think Christopher Nolan kind of has this one wrapped up. Um, but, you know, there could be a twist or a turn or... A, there could. You but we'll know. see. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we'll see what happens. And um, with that tone, we're going to get into our last category, and that's with the best picture category. So if you guys followed us for last week, you found out that the best picture category has expanded, and there are 10 films. Um, <laughs> Sam says Nolan should have won for all his films. I think Nolan's like one of my favorite act- directors. I mean, Fincher. Uh, like, I think Nolan's a little bit above Fincher, but you know, um, him and Fincher are like up there for me. I, I love both all their stuff. Um, but for the nominees for Best Picture are American Fiction uh, by Ben LeClaire, Nikos 
Carmigos, Core Jefferson, and Jermaine Johnson as the producers. Um, Tommy will fall with Marie Ange Luciani and David Theon as the producers. Barbie for David Hyman, Margaret Robbie, Tom Akery, and Robbie Brennan for producers. Uh, on that front, uh, Gerwig is the only director ever to see her first three feature film outings, Lady Bird, Little Women, and Barbie, nominated for Best Picture. So, going to be pretty hard to top that. So, um, that's awesome stuff. Uh, the Holdovers by Mark Johnson. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon by Dan Fretkin. Bradley Thomas, Martin Scorsese, and Daniel Lupi. Maestro by Bradley Cooper, Steven Spielberg, Fred Brennan, Amy During, and Christy Mosco Krieger. Mokosko. You know, she came up a lot with, she's a, a very big collaborator of Spielberg films. Um, while he hasn't directed a, or a film nominated, he is credited as a producer on Bradley Cooper's Maestro. Spielberg initially intended to direct the film, a uh, Leonard Bernstein biopic, which is Maestro, but chose Cooper to make it after seeing A Star is Born. And then uh, for his participation in Maestro, Spielberg amassed his 13th Best Picture nomination, a record for an individual producer. So Spielberg getting trying to uh, rack up those Oscars. Uh, yeah. Oppenheimer for with Emma Thomas, Carl Charles Roven, and Christopher Nolan as producers. Four Things, Agini, Andrew Lowe, Yorgos Lathimos, and Emma Stone as producers. And then The Zone of Interest, James Wilson as the producer. Uh, the Zone of Interest is a ninth non-language English language film to be nominated in both the international feature and the best picture categories in the same year. Other such duels were Z in 1969, Life is Beautiful in 1998, Parasite, which is a film Roxy just mentioned in 2019, and Drive My Car in 2021. Uh, so, Tone, who's your best picture of the year? You know, you know, I mean, I, I just wish I want everyone to go and watch the holdovers as much as they can. You know, I know it's not going to win best picture here. But to me, it feels like a movie that could have won in a different time period because it's a different time period type of movie. Um, if you're feeling a certain way in your life, it's a good movie to watch to kind of put you in perspective a little bit about different things. Um, but who do I think is going to win? You know, I, I really think Oppenheimer is going to win. I mean, I don't see any other road for any other movie to win. And if it did, it would be a complete shock, I mean, to me. But... Um, back to somebody again, I read, said that the holdovers was the sixth out of the eight best Alexander Payne films, which to me, Alexander Payne is another great director and putting this movie as a sixth best and also saying that, um, you know, the performance by the supporting actress is mid at best when to me, the Oscars were pretty much created for the scene when she's in the kitchen talking about her son, when she's sad. And to say that, like, to me, that it's mid, I don't know, it just bothers me. But again, Oppenheimer, I think, is going to win. Yeah, I think Oppenheimer is going to win. I will agree with you there. Uh, Kills Our Flower Moon, I think, should be a tie with uh, the holdovers. So if I'm going to kind of cheat and say those three films, if either of all, any of those films win, Killers of Flower Moon, the holdovers are Oppenheimer, I will not be upset about it. Um, I thought Killers of Flower Moon was very powerful. And like I said earlier, uh, I thought Oppenheimer was very powerful, very good. The holdover, ah, I just wish the holdovers, like, why wasn't the holdovers, like, even last year? Even last though I year, loved that film. Before, it would have won. Even though I, I, I loved really the, everything, like everywhere, all at once. I, th I love that film. But I, if, I think if the holdovers was then, they would have swept. They might have. They <laughs> uh, everything. Might have. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go with Oppenheimer. I th just looking at the, the, you know, the metrics and, like, previous nominations and you can kind of see like the trending uh, uh how the film is going to do in terms of winning awards it's already won the spirit it's already won the golden globes um i love i like the film i i enjoyed it a lot uh but you know i really like the holdovers and i i like cut for those of flower moon so i will say oppenheimer will get the nod here from me but if those other two films come out and win that'd be great uh barbie i think should be even up there as well even though it wasn't for me uh, it's still beautifully shot and it, it resonated with a lot of people, you know, in their childhoods. And, you know, I, American fiction is another film. It's, but, uh, you know, this, this category in Best Picture, usually when you see it, you see, even though it's at eight, you have a, a film on there like, oh, how, you know, 
why is that film there? It, there's another one that's better than that. I think this is a strong eight films, it I mean, is. 10 films uh, that were nominated. Um, it, is, it kind of goes a little bit against what mm-hmm. we were talking about in some of those down years we were going through last week where it was like only one or two we could even even talk about. We're like, well, what were these other ones? Um, it'll be interesting also to look back on this in 10, 12 years and see if we'll remember all of these movies the same way. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely. Uh, you know, you know, reflecting on it later, you know, we'll see how it goes. But goes, but you know, I, I this Oscars is going to be good this year. For Oscars is going to be very, very good to see who wins. It's very, very packed. Um, probably one of the best Oscar years I can remember in a very long time. Yeah, definitely. Um, but those are our picks for the Oscars. Let us know what you guys think. Uh. You know, at um, at um, oh man, I was gonna say our old show at the at the show pod on Twitter, or at um, Statistic Opinion Studios. There, uh, let, let us know in a tweet and let us know, or leave us in the comments down on the YouTube channel. Um, that's basically our Oscar show, man. Yeah, I can't wait to see all the winners. I definitely will be watching. Uh, if we still did, if Brian wasn't doing a show that night, I would say, hey, let's do a playback because I, I like doing the playbacks for those. Um, but you know, I'm definitely going to have, it's getting drafty on Sunday and I'm going to have the Oscars on. So I'll be going in between both of them. Um, definitely. But yeah, the Oscars, I always enjoy watching the Oscars for the night. Uh, any final thoughts, Tom? No, I mean, again, um, interesting and going to be a good show. Um, going to going to be some, some good music, uh, performed from the Barbie movie. Um, you know, it's a lot of the cool, like the scripts and all of that. It's, it's There's a lot that goes into the show. And honestly, Jimmy Kimmel, the host, he I've seen a couple of his other ones. He, he does it a pretty good job. Um, it should be a good show. Yeah, definitely. Um, looking forward to it. Uh, so that's our Oscar talk for the episode. Uh, this is a little shorter one because we only went through the six categories. But we got two little more things, little nuggets for you, as they say. Uh, let's get into um, our next, you know, little thing we do. Tell them, let's go tell everybody uh, what's coming soon. Let's get ready to rumble. Coming soon. Proximamente. Coming soon. Coming soon. So what do we got, my man? Coming up down the hatch, we got a movie that I know you are super, 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 super excited to talk about. It's a movie that another one, if you're feeling really down, this one will definitely cheer you up with great stories behind the scenes. No, I'm just, it's a lot of different stuff is going to go into this. Um, We have talked about uh, personally on the, um, um, the hookup on music show, the soundtrack, (laughs) the soundtrack uh, a couple times and definitely just really, really, really going to be an awesome deep dive into a movie that a lot, a lot of people um enjoy including brian yeah i know um brian was telling us earlier he's not going to be able to show up till nine i was going to ask if we should hold off to start till he even gets there because we know how much you're gonna love this one (laughs) oh brian you're gonna hate watch it's okay oh you'll love it you know you love spending time with us (laughs) yeah i'm a huge fan of the film um i know brian gives me a hard time for it but uh really really enjoyed uh your conversation with trees from the 108 (laughs) <laughs> um, works like that. let's do a crow episode yeah just for you ryan uh it's one of those films it's getting a remake so it's a good time to bring it up it's get we you know we saw the pictures of um bill skarsgård as the crow uh i am uncertain how it's gonna go from there but i mean like i've seen people say bad stuff about pattinson as as batman and even when stark got when um Downey got cast as Stark. So I'll give it a chance. Like, this is one of my favorite movies, just visually. I love it. Uh, Alex Poros is one of my favorite directors. Dark City is another film that I love from him. Um, and this film has a lot of backstory to it. Uh, something that's even dealing with today with Rust, you know, yeah. a film Rust that just happened with Alec Baldwin and this, and this fortunate incident there. Uh, awesome soundtrack as well. I actually uh, listened to this soundtrack today on um, record, on vinyl. I, I spent it today during work. I can't uh, stop listening to the Nine Inch Nails cover of Dead Souls. It's yes. pretty much like the way the days go at work. It just pretty much makes me, yeah. Cheryl Crow, yes. This is actually a biopic of Cheryl Crow mm-hmm. um, before she hit it big. It's kind of like when she was going to joint kiss 
and she didn't know who she was gonna be. No, no. I love Cheryl Crow. Yeah, Cheryl Crow's um, great. But yeah, definitely a totally total uh cult classic, a film that inspired so many different things from uh wrestling to you know uh part of the hardcore music scene uh it was like one of the like i said one of the best albums released and if you don't like the movie and brian, brian will agree that one of the best soundtracks you know there's out there um which you know, it's great to listen to and like yeah the, just the visuals of dead souls i'm thinking of it in my head right now yeah i love oh, yeah. that scene um oh, yeah. but i'm really excited to get into this one it's one of my favorites and i know you love it too it'll be good it makes you happy you can't be that bad. that is true sam that is true that's true um but since we're already kind of talking about music a little bit uh let's uh let's get into the uh sugar baggy soundtrack pick of the week the sugar baggy soundtrack pick of the week All right, here we go. I'm going to throw on a song here. It's in the end credits of the movie I'm going to talk about. Uh, it, if you don't know it, it's okay. I'm going to here here we go right here. Here is the music video. It's only about 7 seconds. You might not get it. Okay, tonight what I've decided to do is, if you don't know Yump, it's okay, I'm about to tell you. It is in two weeks, folks. We got something big planned here down at the, at the show podcast. And tonight I wanted just to give you a little bit of a taste because the Roadhouse soundtrack is personally one of my favorite soundtracks of all time. And in two weeks, with the unfortunate, I'm going to just say, release of the Jake Gyllenhaal new movie, here at the show, we are going to be doing Roadhouse. And, you know, tonight I just wanted to just just, just really quick, because we'll also be talking about it on the show, just talk about how awesome this soundtrack is. Um, personally, if anybody out there has the Spotify, there's a whole Roadhouse playlist. There's like 40 songs. Amazing, but uh, really, really good stuff. That Jeff Healy song that you heard there a second it is in the final credits where Dalton is in the pond making out. And uh, really, really awesome. Going to be a really, really good time in two weeks. But I picked this one because the music in the movie is great. And it also let me let everyone know that uh, it's going to be really, really cool in two weeks. We'll, we're going to be talking some Roadhouse. So Crow, Roadhouse, great soundtracks. Man, this show's just getting better by the day. She's like the. I'm sorry, right? She's like the win. <laughs> yeah, uh, Roadhouse. Yeah, great awesome, songs from the awesome movie. Awesome content. Uh, I knew it right away when I saw Jeff Healy. Who? Yeah, oh yeah, I knew you did. That was yeah. the giveaway. I would um, put you on the spot without knowing. That. But yeah, um, one of my favorite songs from the Roadhouse album is uh, "Don't Throw Stones." Yeah, uh, by the Crusados. Song. Uh, who is also Tito and Tarantula from from yeah. Dust Till Dawn. The same guy. It's this band he had. Uh, the live version is really good. Have you heard it? The live version. Oh yeah, that's actually what is on the um that Roadhouse uh, playlist. Playlist. Because I actually was at work yesterday, sitting there listening to the playlist before yeah. school, blasting it over the speakers, and uh, just definitely, definitely lots of good songs in the movie. I'm actually very excited because me and my wife we speak Roadhouse to each <laughs> other. We um. <laughs> There isn't a day that we can't pick out the most randomest quote from this movie and we know about it because we've watched it that much. Um, but it's just a really, really awesome soundtrack. Great music. Um, but uh going to be cool in two weeks. Yeah, definitely. And uh, we uh, have the new movie. We're going to be going through that a little bit with a special guest, but we don't want to spoil that for no, you. Not yet. Um, but yeah, definitely looking forward to that one. Uh, so we got two back-to-back -back bangers in the uh, the Crow and then Roadhouse back-to-back. Uh, -back. So really, really looking forward to the next two weeks. Two of our favorite films. Uh, doing deep dives on them. It's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. Um, Tone, man, we uh, we broke, we kind of breezed through this episode. I thought it was going to be a yeah. little longer. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a good thing, though. Sometimes you got to keep them a little shorter. Uh, yeah. I know the last two have been extremely long. Yeah. But uh, shout-out to uh, Roxy for coming on for... The Never Seen It segment. Uh, be sure to check out her stuff on the all sports scene. Uh, also, a big shout out to the Chicago Sports Bums who did a uh, they did a happy hour before our show from six to eight. Awesome. Check them out at the Shy Sports Bums. 
uh, awesome guys. Uh, we worked with them a lot. Um, good people. Uh, they've been in our shows. We, uh, we've been on theirs, and we actually did a live event with them before. Uh, good dudes. Uh, great sports stuff, and um, you know, be sure to check them out. Uh, also, um, the 108 tournament is here. So if you guys are into the 108 tournament, check out them. I actually got in for the first year, which surprised the hell out of me. Um, but we have a lot of penguins in there and a lot of uh, ass members, all sports team members, and the bums are in there. So be sure to support your favorite people. Uh, content will be coming. Uh, I just have to think of some stuff to do. Um, uh, you know, it's just I didn't think I was going to get in, which is kind of funny. But um, yeah, really honored to be in that. I, you know, I don't really hang out with those guys to be in the tournament per se, but uh, it was kind of cool they put me in. Also, a big fan of uh, Cherizi, uh, Beef Loaf, and My Sock Summer, all great guys. And, uh, you know, they've supported us for a while, too. So be sure to check them out. As well as the Hookup on Music, which Cherizi was just on with you, Tone. Uh, great job. I watched, listened to that during work. I actually listened to it a couple times. It was actually a really, really fun episode. Uh, a lot of fun. I'm pretty sure you guys could talk for like three hours about Oh, yeah. He, it's one of those things where what I always try to do in these conversations is kind of like a movie. Stop it, and you know you want to finish it, so you'll come back again. And how long is this movie? We don't know. It could last, and that's what we talked about after. In a couple months, we're going to do it again and continue the conversation. That's what's cool is that we could talk about this all. I mean, like me and you can. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the world could change and this could have been a music show. I mean, you could talk about your great, great. Everybody is really awesome at, at the conversation, which is what we like here at the yeah, yeah. Penguin Studios. Definitely. Yeah. And also check out, it's getting drafting here on Sunday for Brian's show. I believe he'll be going on at eight o'clock. Uh, Brian, refresh my memory. What is your topic this week? Wasn't coming. it uh, baseball? We're back. Oh, baseball! Yeah, baseball's yeah. back. So they're oh, he's doing a draft of players from each decade, uh, which I think is kind of cool from the fifties and on. So that's gonna be kind of cool to see who they pick. Um, check that out. Uh, like I said, check out the hookup on music. Check out the bums. Check out the one hundred and eight. Check out Bry. I'm excited show. tomorrow, Saturday, because now it really gives me some freedom to get a lot of that fast food that was on that last episode. Um, you know, last week I already had Portillo's, I think, twice. So I'm, I'm going to get something <laughs> different this week, definitely. Yeah, definitely. He did a fast food draft, which is hilarious. Uh, check Great. that out as well. Uh, but thank you again for watching. Thank you so much for everybody who was in the comments, uh, who likes, subscribed, did all that fun jazz. Uh, we will see you next week on Friday for The Crow. And you guys have a great night. Take care. Thanks for listening to the At The Show Podcast. A Sadistic Penguin Studios production. Game over, man. It's game over. What the fuck are we going to do now? What are we going to do? Maybe we could build a fire, sing a couple of songs, huh? Why don't we try that?